In this video, we're going to develop a model for static friction. Again, an agent and object are in contact with each other, but this time they're at rest. Nothing is moving with respect to each other. We must require at least one surface to be flat so we can find surfaces that are parallel and perpendicular to that surface. Let's take a look at that book on an incline again. Here we had a book on an incline, but now it's not moving, it's stuck. We want to develop a model of this, frictional force that is holding it up the incline. Just like with the kinetic friction, we have to start with the normal force. Looking at a free body diagram, where I have a pair of axes set parallel and perpendicular to the ground, and parallel and perpendicular to the angled surface. We find the normal force, which is perpendicular to that surface, and then our frictional force follows a similar path to that of kinetic friction. The magnitude of our static friction force is proportional to the magnitude of the normal force, and so I've written it here, where I have the frictional force is equal to a parameter, mu sub s this time, the coefficient of static friction, times the magnitude of the normal force. One important difference is that this coefficient of static friction is not a constant. It can vary, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The direction of the frictional force is parallel to the surface again, but this time we say it is directed opposite the direction the object would move if there were no friction. Let's talk about that for a second. So if we look at this system and imagine there were no friction, then the book would slide down the incline. So the static frictional force is opposing the motion that would happen if there were no friction. Static friction is essentially preventing the movement from happening. We can now put it on the free body diagram, and it would look like this. Just like before, the normal force and the static friction force are components of the same contact force. There is a single contact force between the surface and the book, and we're just breaking that contact force into components, one perpendicular to the plane of contact, that's the normal force, and one parallel to the plane of contact. While it is slightly confusing to think about, well, I have to imagine how it would move if friction is not there, certainly the most confusing thing is the idea that this coefficient of static friction is not a constant. What does that mean? Well, to remember in the video, the book didn't move for a wide range of angles. In fact, continuously from zero up to 22 degrees, the book stayed at rest relative to the shelf it was on. Let's go ahead and calculate the coefficient of static friction and see what that means. What are the forces on the object? Well, there's gravity and there's just one contact force. And that contact force is being broken up into normal and frictional components that we're going to put on our free body diagram. To set up my free body diagram, I have two sets of axes, one parallel and perpendicular to the ground, and one parallel and perpendicular to the incline. I've identified the theta between all the points on my axes that is equal to the theta from the problem. Now let's look at the forces. The first force is the force due to gravity, and it points down. Then there's the normal force and the frictional force that we saw before. The normal force perpendicular and the frictional force parallel to the surface. We need a coordinate system, and I've set up positive x to the right and positive y up. Now to apply Newton's second law, we have the vector sum of all the forces is equal to the mass of that one object times its acceleration. Starting with gravity, I'm going to need to find the components of gravity because the gravity itself is not along the x or y axis. So I draw a line from the tip of the vector to one of the axes such that it makes a right angle, and then with the magnitude of the force as the hypotenuse, then the lengths of these two sides of the triangle give me the magnitudes of the components. Putting that in, I have th the magnitude of the force due to gravity is mg, so I have mg sine theta is the x component because it's opposite the angle, and mg cosine theta 
is the y component because it's adjacent to the angle. From the signs, I look at the coordinate system. Here's the x equals 0 axis here, and we see the x component is on the positive x side, and the y component is on the negative y side. For the normal force, the x component is 0 because it only lies along the y axis. So its entire magnitude is the y component, and it's in the positive y direction. The force due to friction only lies along the x axis. So the entire magnitude is the x component, and it points in the negative x direction. And I've substituted in our static friction model. The magnitude of the frictional force is a coefficient of static friction times a magnitude of the normal force. In this case, the object's not moving at all, so the acceleration in both dimensions is equal to zero. This can give us scalar relationships between all of these parameters, and we can solve for the coefficient of static friction in terms of the other quantities. Along the y-axis, we had a negative mg cosine theta plus the magnitude of the normal force is equal to zero. And among the x components, we had mg sine theta minus the coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force. I'm going to use the first equation to solve for the magnitude of the normal force and then substitute it into the blue equation. If I just bring mg cosine theta on the other side, I now have a expression for the normal force. If I substitute that into the blue equation, I get this expression. Now it looks like I can divide both sides by mg, and that just goes away. If I bring the mu sub s cosine theta on the other side, I now have the coefficient of static friction cosine theta is equal to sine theta, divide both sides by cosine theta, and I get that the coefficient of static friction is equal to tangent theta. Think about what that means in terms of the video. As one side of the shelf increased, theta increased during that entire time. The coefficient of static friction increased during that entire time. So the coefficient of static friction changed until it started down the shelf. If we look at it, how it changes, we see that at 5 degrees it had a value of 0 0.088. At 10 degrees it had a value of 0.18. At 15, 0.27. At 20, 0.36. And finally, at 22 degrees was the highest point it reached before the book slid. That's a characteristic of the coefficient of static friction. It has a maximum value, and it is the maximum value that defines it. And then it can take any value between zero and that maximum value. Before, we calculated the coefficient of kinetic friction for this example. And we noticed that the coefficient of static friction was larger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. And that is almost always true for materials. Static friction works like this. Imagine you're trying to pull off a piece of tape. And if you pull on it with just a little force, it needs just a little force to keep being stuck. So you pull on it with a little more force, but it's still stuck pulling back with a little more force, matching the amount of force you're providing as you try to pull it off and it will continue to increase matching the amount of force you're applying to try to pull it off until you provide a larger force to be able to pull it off. In our static friction model, the frictional force is equal to this coefficient times this normal force. We see the force continually changing through the changing values of the coefficient of static friction and the maximum force before it finally slides is related to that maximum value of the coefficient of static friction. And like the coefficient of kinetic friction, this coefficient varies between all systems. It depends on the material, it depends on the surface quality, as well as environmental effects. You can look up maximum values for typical substances and tables, or it's something you either have to measure, like we just did, or have to be given as part of a problem.